everybody. Thanks for joining us, uh, Renewal Cast today. We are joined by uh, Scott Clark, Dr. Clark, uh, and he's going to help us uh, think through some uh, law and gospel. I'm going to put him on the, I'm going to put him in the hot seat here, and uh, and then, uh, but we just we just want to. Uh, really thank you for, for joining us and, and taking your time to, to be with us today. Why don't you take a, a little bit of a time, uh, Dr. Clark, and just tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and about your, your ministry and anything else you'd like to share with us as we begin. Okay. I am a, a pastor in the United Reform Churches. I'm an, uh, I am a, um, what is my title? Associate Minister in the Escondido United Reformed Church. I uh, was ordained to pastoral ministry in 1988, uh, started as an assistant pastor in Kansas City in 1987, um, served in Kansas City for uh, six years at what is now Northland Reformed Church. So if you're um, up, up by the airport in Kansas City, that's where they are now, I think, on uh, Cookingham Road. And uh, that, but when I was there, we were uh, uh, down by uh, North Kansas City. I uh, went to a seminary uh, where I teach now, Westminster Seminary, California. Um, married, two kids, uh, grown kids, no grandkids. Um, I teach at Westminster Seminary, California, where I have been teaching since 1997. Before that, I taught at Wheaton College for a couple of years. Um, I taught a few other places uh, over the years, you know, visit, as a visiting prof um, and the like. I teach church history, historical theology. I have taught systematics, though I haven't taught it for a number of years. I used to teach the doctrine of God. I've taught prolegomena. Uh, I taught a survey course one, uh, one semester years ago. But uh, mostly I teach history. I, I teach uh, patristics, uh, medieval Reformation and and then some uh, post Reformation uh, Reformed scholasticism and my academic interests, my writing interests tend to uh, be around Reformed Orthodoxy, Reformed theology, the history of Reformed, of Reformed theology, piety and practice. Um, that's where I've, I've published um, a couple of books on that topic: one, recovering the Reformed Confession. And uh, one on Caspar Olivianus, who's an early Reformed covenant theologian from the 16th century and um, one of the contributors to the Heidelberg Catechism. I write a blog, heidelblog.net, and I do a couple of podcasts, office hours for work, and uh, my own uh, personal podcast, The Heidelcast. I don't know. Is that it? Is that enough? <laughs> yeah, that, that, you, did a, you did a good job. I, I uh in the comments on our on our Facebook page, I, I put your uh, your bio. Uh, I was wondering how you were going to get through all that in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> we, we like to we like to uh, be done with this podcast in about a half an hour. Or so oh, okay, all right. Well, <laughs> no, uh, that's more than that was, enough. That was excellent. Though. You you are involved in a, a lot of a lot of things, and um, but John, our normal co-host, is from Nebraska, so we need to mention that you are from Nebraska. Go, yeah, go well. big red. Yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> There's the, not, you see, people don't believe me. This it is a real, honest to goodness, <laughs> old school cowbell. <laughs> that that I I don't remember where I got. I think that might be from Barbara's Grandpa's farm, but I'm not sure. I can't say for certain. But um, um, anyway, it's the real thing. <laughs> Then I, I have the, I have the digital thing. Here we go. <laughs> that will work. Oh, hold on. Let's see. There we go. Hold on. There we go. That's the digital version. <laughs> so, all right. So, in are you guys having in person classes at all uh, at this point? We, we did last fall, off and on. We were uh, we were uh, online, and then we were hybrid. And okay. then um, right at the end of the semester, we had to go online again, full-time online. So right now, we are online. Uh, we're hoping to be able to go back to hybrid classes uh, later. Now we're So we're in between uh, terms right now. We have the fall term 
fall semester, then the January term, and uh, then the spring semester starts um, later this month, February 9th, maybe. So I've been I've been in the middle of a big writing project, and honestly, I I um, other than answering some email and um, you know killing some time on Twitter here and there, uh, mostly I have not been paying attention to the schedule. So, but we I I hope um, that um, uh, we'll be uh, we'll be able to go back because we they just uh, opened up the restaurants again, not to eat indoors, but but we're not. You know, they, they, they canceled the curfew and, and uh, we're not totally locked down the way we were. I've been, this is my project. This is part of my project right now. And this is Olivia, this is Ursinus's um, commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism. It's, it's one of the Latin texts. So this is the one I'm using that. Um, so I'm, I'm working on a commentary on the Heidelberg and, yeah. and um, going back and forth with Ursinus. So it turns out the the our English translation our our English translation that we have from Willard is it's good but it's also problematic. <laughs> he, he has a tendency to add things that that Ursinus didn't say. Anyway, so it's been interesting. So be. yeah, we're, that's where we're hoping to be uh, back in person at least uh, somewhat mm. um, later in the semester. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, we've been on our podcast. We've been we've been uh, going through the the 1689 uh, London Baptist Confession. Is kind of what we've been uh, doing, and just kind of having discussions on that. And and one of the things that that continues to come up, uh, whether we're going through that or we're talking about some other issue, is uh, the the law gospel distinction. And we're we're seeing uh, just how important uh, important that is. And. Uh, so we wanted to talk about that today uh, and uh, maybe the, the history of it a little bit and how we have come to, to understand things the, the way that, that we do. And maybe if you would just take a, a moment and explain to us a little bit in, in your words what what we mean by the, the law gospel distinction. And yeah, sure. Why, it's, why it's, important. It's, yeah. it's a really important distinction and uh it's one of the um, four or five things that really made the Reformation transformational. Um, so, if, in other words, if you if you take away sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, um, and the, the the distinction between law and gospel, you uh, and the for example the doctrine of imputation, those would be the absolute rock bottom essentials. So you take away any one of those things and you lose the Reformation. In the modern period, we've had a lot of trouble with that, particularly in the Reformed world uh, for a variety of reasons. We just lost track of that distinction, it, uh, in part because it came to be seen in the broader evangelical world and in the um, um, more narrowly in the Reformed world as a, uh, a Lutheran distinctive, but not something that the Reformed held or taught. And and that people came to think that and they said that sort of thing and wrote that sort of thing because we had stopped reading our own tradition. And uh, and we had bought into a story that was more put together, I guess, I was going to say fabricated, but uh, put together in the, in the 19th century that said that the Lutheran uh, central doctrine is justification, the Reformed central doctrine or dogma is uh, divine sovereignty or you know, predestination, election, however you want to put it. And uh, that whole story is um, uh, complete caca. It, 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 there's no truth to it at all. It's completely false. B.B. Uh, Warfield said so in the late 19th, early 20th century. He said, you can't tell the story that way. It, uh, that uh, uh, it, that was never true of the Lutherans, and it was never true of, of the Reformed. Uh, but that was the way the story came to be told in the 19th century, and, and lots of people have bought that story, and that's how they think of themselves. And so this is why you see all of these young, restless, and Reformed people um, – describing a new Calvinist, so-called new Calvinist, describing themselves as reformed. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? And, and they, they simply mean, I believe in divine sovereignty. And that is, the, as far as they know, 
the be all and end all, the warp and woof of what it is to be reformed. And in the whole 16th and 17th centuries, uh, all those people are spinning in their graves. They're all doing, you know, uh, 1800 RPM uh, because the, uh, that just is a complete misrepresentation of what it is to be reformed. There's a whole lot more uh, to being reformed. But, uh, and it, one of the, the things that makes the reformed reformed is the distinction between law and gospel, which we share with our, our Lutheran brothers and sisters. Um, so it, uh, where, where did it come from? Uh, this is an ancient distinction in some ways. Uh, we've been distinguishing in some way between law and gospel since the very early days of the church. The early church spoke of the old law and the new law. Uh, so there, uh, that was one way of doing it. And they were thinking in historical terms. Um, in other words, they were, they were thinking of the uh, uh, Old Testament and the New Testament as the old law and the new law. And then the church would came to use law and gospel as synonyms so that the law stands for the Old Testament and the gospel stands for the New Testament. They weren't saying that, um, they weren't making the, the, the same distinction that we make today, right, that the Reformation made, although Augustine begins to do it. If you look in his uh, treatise on the spirit and the letter, uh, where he he's, takes uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6 as his starting point, you can see that he begins to talk about the what the law can and can't do and what the gospel can and can't do. And he talks about the law and the gospel in different ways. Uh, so there are, I used to think... Sometimes, or I have thought sometimes that, that Luther was exaggerating a bit because he says in, in some place that he's delighted to see that that um, Augustine also, uh, in, and he's thinking of this treatise, he's referring to this treatise, also distinguished between law and gospel. And I've sometimes thought, well, that's a little hyperbole. Uh, but I actually think maybe Luther, Luther had a point. There, are, If you read Augustine, and I think you really do have to, on these sorts of things, read Augustine slowly and carefully, because sometimes it's very dense. He actually does begin to distinguish between the law as one kind of thing, uh, wherever it is in Scripture, and the gospel as another kind of thing. And um, he does begin to talk about the law for sinners as bad news and the gospel as good news. But for most of Christian history, between Augustine and the the Reformation, people thought of law and gospel principally in historical terms. So the law is the Old Testament, the gospel is the New Testament. But they tended also to think of, uh, and Thomas is very clear about this, Aquinas is clear, that the Bible is all law. The Old Testament is the old law. The New Testament is the new law. And the difference between the old and the new is that there's uh, more grace under the new. The Holy Spirit has been poured out under the new. Um, and um, and uh, we don't have the types and shadows anymore uh, under the new law. But we're still basically, we, we, we relate to God uh, fundamentally on the uh, on the basis of the law. So, uh, the, the great breakthrough of the Reformation was for Luther to recover uh, the notion that, I think it's very clearly a Pauline notion, I think it's elsewhere, it, I think it's all throughout Scripture, but it's very clearly Pauline, that relative to sinners, the law says one thing, it says do this and live. And the gospel says, uh, looking forward from the Old Testament, that Christ shall do, right? The seed of the woman will do battle with the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the woman will crush the serpent. You know that. So that is a promise of the gospel. Looking forward, um, whether you're looking at um, you know Isaiah fifty two fifty three or um, Isaiah seven or you know Psalm one hundred and ten or Psalm twenty two or wherever you're looking in the Old Testament, um, the, um, the gospel is a promise of something that's coming. And um, and then in the New Testament, of course, we're looking retrospectively, looking backward and saying, uh, so the gospel is what Christ has done for us. And um, those are two different kinds of words. And uh, and so what the Protestants did, Lutheran and Reformed did, was to uh, begin to use that question, that uh, that distinction as a kind of hermeneutical question. How do How does this passage before me relate to law and gospel? So, for example, uh, Theodore Beza in the 1550s says that the, the greatest uh, problem afflicting the church today is the uh, inability of people or the refusal of people to distinguish between law and gospel. William Perkins said in his uh, famous book on preaching, The Art of Prophesying, that before you ever 
uh, preach a passage, you have to determine whether this passage is law or gospel. So this was a basic conceptual distinction that uh, that the Protestants came to make. Um, and Luther said that when he uh, discovered or rediscovered the distinction between law and gospel, it, you know, it was transformative of the way he read the Bible. And, and um, that was certainly true in my experience because I, I was a preacher for 10 years and I knew the theory in some ways of the distinction between law and gospel, but I didn't know the practice of it. And I, 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 uh, I had not been drilled in distinguishing between law and gospel. And uh, so it, um, oftentimes in my preaching, and I'm not saying that I haven't done it since, but at least if I, if I, if I do it now, it's, um, I'm doing it against my better judgment and my, my conscious intent. Uh, but for a good 10 years, I would uh, preach the gospel. I remember preaching a series through the Exodus, and the gospel, of course, is all through the Exodus. But then at the end of the sermon, I felt like I had some obligation to apply the passage, which is not unreasonable. You, you want the application to come out of the text. But I thought I, 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 I somehow had got the idea that uh, to apply the passage, I almost needed to put them back under the law. And so I was doing that. And I knew there was something pretty profoundly wrong with my preaching, and I'm sure many people would have agreed that there are many, uh, there were many things wrong with my preaching, and maybe and still are. But there was one thing that was seriously wrong with my preaching, and I couldn't tell what it was, and nobody else seemed to know what it was. And um, and it was only when I heard uh, uh, Mike Horton give a 20 minute talk in the summer of 1998. We had a conference on preaching on the campus. We had Jay Adams here. We had Tim Keller. Uh, today, if we did this conference, you know, it, it probably would be a big deal. But this was just a bunch of guys meeting literally in the in the uh, seminary um, student lounge, and we were guys making a bunch of guys making presentations on preaching. Bob Godfrey. Um, I don't mean to leave anybody else out, but uh, there were there were other several people making. 20 minute presentations on preaching. Mike got up and made a presentation on distinguishing law and gospel in preaching. And th that at that moment I realized, yeah, um, yes, this is what has been wrong with my preaching for 10 years that I haven't been making that distinction as I've been uh, speaking to the people. And as I've been looking at the text, analyzing the text, I, I wasn't using that distinction to help me understand the text. So that's, um, so that's a, a thumbnail sketch of, of how we got where we are. There's a chapter in a book called uh, Covenant Justification and Pastoral Ministry um, where I discuss this some more. Oh, there it is. Yeah, the, the title of the chapter is Letter and Spirit. And then there are a lot of uh, resources. There's a whole resource page on the Heidel blog, heidelblog.net slash resources. And under there, uh, there are lots of resources on uh, distinguishing law and gospel. And, and in, <clears throat> just in case the listener is thinking well or the viewer is thinking, yeah, well, I understand the Lutherans do that, but the Reformed, we don't do that. Um, there, I have lots of source materials showing uh, the opposite in both the chapter and and online. So, yeah. so <clears throat> you said it's it's Lutheran, Luther and, and Melanchthon helped recover it, and Calvin basically agreed. But also the Baptists came along too, I like to quote Spurgeon on the Law Gospel singer. So, how is it's pretty ecumenical. It's really a Protestant distinction. Yeah, for anybody who is uh, genuinely connected to the Reformation, it's an essential distinction. Now, the Anabaptists did not accept it. So there's a distinction between the Anabaptists and the Baptists on that point. That's an important distinction. The Anabaptists thought it was a terrible distinction that uh, that by saying that sort of thing, you were going to lead people to immorality and impiety. And... Uh, um, lots of uh, Reformed folk have also, in, in the modern period, against their tradition and I think against their confession, have also denied it. Um, the Federal Visionists have denied it. Of course, Rome denies it. And uh, but most of the time, people are just ignorant of it. That's the that's the the main challenge that we have: is that people just aren't aware of the fact that there is such a distinction and uh, what it is and, and how it functions or how it helps. There seems to be. A lot of confusion today with it yet, too. I know there's a five views book on Law Gospel. I haven't read it. Did they just make up some more views to get the five different views? Or how many? <laughs> well, you know, if you're thinking of the same one I'm thinking of, um, the, the actual traditional Reformed view isn't even represented in the book. Um, so 
I'm <laughs> honestly, I, I'm not a big fan of those things. Uh, those things are only as good as the selections and the editor. So um, sometimes I guess they can be helpful. But th- I remember looking at that book, thinking, "Well, this is not helpful um, mm-hmm. a- at all." It it isn't really all that difficult to to uh, see the different views. Um, yeah. Um, so one article I read had. Uh, it affirmed law gospel in regards to historical nature, which you've already mentioned, and in the systematic form for justification. But then when it came to law gospel as a hermeneutic, it completely denied that aspect as helpful. And because how they understood it was that it denied the third use of the law. Well, that no, that's completely wrong and uh, wrongheaded and ignorant uh, because the, uh, the people who gave us the law gospel distinction also taught the third use of the law. So let's say I'm not a Lutheran. I'm uh, actually engaging in a fair bit of uh, research on the Lutherans and uh, some critique of the Lutherans in the work that I'm doing right now. Um, but uh, I, uh, we have to tell the truth, right? That's essential. Uh, so it's not hard to find out what the Lutherans say. Uh, they publish their views, their official views, in a, in a large volume. This is the modern critical edition. It's called the Book of Concord. And it's got the Luther's catechisms. It's got the formula of Concord, the epitome of the formula of Concord, uh, and a whole bunch of, of documents, obviously. It's uh, 600 and some pages. And uh, in there, if, some, if somebody will take the five minutes... It takes take the five minutes it takes to um, to discover what the Lutherans say uh, on this. One will see that the Lutherans affirm both the distinction between law and gospel, as we do, and also the third use of the law. In fact, it was Melanchthon who gave us the the language um, tertius usus legis, third use of the law. So um, they've always and Luther teaches it in su- in substance. Uh, he, in fact. It was Luther who gave us the term antinomianism because he was opposing antinomians in the 1520s and continued to oppose different forms of antinomianism in the subsequent decades. And all the magisterial Protestants opposed uh, antinomianism, which uh, in essence is the denial of the third use of the law. So to suggest that making a hermeneutical distinction leads to antinomianism is absurd uh, because the people who, who gave us the categories, third use of the law, and uh, who gave us the who, who identified antinomianism for what it is are also the people who distinguished between law and gospel. And the the sixteenth century, seventeenth century reformed didn't argue about this. This is something on which they all agreed. So I, this is uh, anybody who says that simply doesn't know what they're talking about and hasn't done the most rudimentary research. I I got a question here that that asked, um, what is the third use of the law? Would you just? Yeah, great question. Third use of the law says that the, that the moral law, we're talking about the Ten Commandments, or as it came to expression, um, whether Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, or I, I would say even before the fall, uh, when the Lord said that the day you eat thereof, you know, you can eat from any tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, but you, you can eat from any tree of the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That is the... Uh, uh, briefest expression of the law, because it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Of course, that's our Lord's summary in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Um, so th- that's the that's the moral law. That's what we're talking about. That's, uh, that's permanent. It doesn't go away because it's grounded in the nature of God. And uh, it's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament, contra the antinomians who say that the moral law, in effect, goes away, and then they, they have uh, substitutes for it. Um, so that we say there are three uses, and uh, they get numbered differently. So I'm just going to call use their proper names. The first use is the, or at least I think of the first use, and the Heidelberg talks about the first use as the pedagogical use, and that's uh, what Paul is referring to in uh, Galatians uh, three, uh, where uh, the law teaches us the greatness of our sin and misery. And uh, and Paul teaches it in Romans and uh, elsewhere, Romans 7, among uh, other places. So the the pedagogical use is where the law teaches us uh, uh, um, our need. 
for a savior. Uh, this The civil use, sometimes called the second use, sometimes it gets reversed, sometimes the civil use is called the first use. The civil use is, is the, um, the use of the moral law to govern society. Um, so how do we know that murder is wrong? Well, it's contrary to the moral law. It's baked into the nature of things. And, and, and um, it's also, Paul says, uh, uh, substantially identical to the natural law. Paul makes reference to that pretty clearly in Romans 2, Romans 1 and 2. How do we know that, for example, same-sex attraction and behavior is sinful? Well, it's contrary to nature, Paul says, um, and uh, the natural law. So the natural law, the moral law, <clears throat> they govern a civil life. And, and we would say, at least I would say as an American, ideologically and, and um, nationally, that uh, we're ma- thinking mainly about the second table, Right, as Americans, I don't. At least as an American, speaking for myself, as an American, I don't want the civil magistrate enforcing the first table of the moral law. Um, I don't want uh, Governor Newsom deciding what religious orthodoxy is or or isn't, and and then punishing people who disagree with with uh, the state of California on religious orthodoxy. We're getting close enough to that as it is. Um, um, so, uh, but the, but we do want the state enforcing the second table. Right, no murder, no theft. Uh, that. That sort of thing, um, no lying in court, right? Those are all violations of the of the civil law. The third use is the the use of the law whereby it governs the Christian life. So um, uh, I don't obey the law in order to be saved uh, or in order to be justified, but as one who has been graciously, freely saved and justified and is being sanctified by grace alone through faith alone. I seek to obey the moral law as the norm of the Christian life. And, and that's just historic Christianity. It's biblical Christianity. That's why Paul turns to the moral law in the second half of most of his epistles, where he, you know, for, he lays out salvation and then turns around and uh, uh, says, and now this is what's uh, expected of you uh, who have been redeemed by grace alone through faith alone. And so that's the third use. Um, so we're, we're not under the law as a covenant of works. We're not under the law in order to be saved or in order to be justified, but we are under the law as the norm of the Christian life. That's the third use of the, of the law. And anybody who denies that is an antinomian. Um, it, it, uh, and, um, and that person doesn't understand either sin or grace. And, and nor does the, the nomist, the neonomian, says, well, no, you obey the law in order to be saved or in order to be justified. Um, so, for example, those people say, well, you're initially justified by grace alone through faith alone, but you're finally justified by, by obedience or law-keeping. Well, those people are neonomians. They don't understand sin. They don't understand grace. They don't understand faith. I mean, they don't really understand the essence of Christianity, frankly. Um, so, so a pox on both the neonomians and, and the antinomians. And see how simple that is. I mean, if a if a if a uh, numbskull like I can, if I can figure it out, uh, and it, anybody can get that. It's not that difficult. Would you say part of the loss of law gospel is because of a loss of the covenant of works? And then, how does covenant of works, covenant of grace relate to law gospel? Yeah, that's a great question. It, uh, you know, in reform circles anyway, because obviously the evangelicals don't think in terms of, of, um, covenant of works, covenant of grace. They don't typically have a covenant theology exactly. They may have one implicitly, but they don't have one, uh, explicitly. Um, but in reform circles, uh, to the degree that people have denied the covenant of works, um, they've rejected it as, as, uh, speculative, unfounded, um, and that was pretty widely done. If you look, <clears throat> if you look through the first um, half of the 20th century, it's very difficult to find anybody defending the covenant of works. Whereas, middle of the 17th century, covenant of works was considered absolutely basic. Uh, all reformed people affirmed the covenant of works. Johannes Coxeus, uh, one of the nice things about working from home is I have, I have all my books here. So Johannes Coxeus wrote a covenant theology on that, and it's based entirely around the covenant of works. All right. And so the whole thing is structured by the covenant of works. That, that's, that's how basic the covenant of works uh, became in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, and that's why it's in the Westminster Confession. Um, 
and it's why it's why it's not expl- expressly articulated in the Belgic or the Heidelberg because they were still working out the vocabulary. Although it, I think it's probably implied in Belgic Article Seven when it says commandment of life. I think that may be a reflection. Ursinus was articulating the Covenant of Works in 1561. Belgic was published in 1561. So that was the turning point historically for that. But we, as you say, we we sort of lost it. Um, There were no summaries of covenant theology until uh, Mike Horton's introduction to covenant theology, whenever that was first published, sometime after 2000. That was the first summary of covenant theology that actually explicitly articulated a covenant of works in in the English language for a, a very long time. Um, so yeah, we, we were, you know, traditional covenant theology. You have a covenant of works before the fall, a covenant of grace after the fall, and uh, behind them, the covenant of redemption between the Father and the Son. Those three covenants, though, that was basic, traditional, bog standard, as they say in England, covenant theology in the 17th century. And uh, by the middle of the 20th century, two thirds of that was gone. You, you you couldn't find hardly anyone teaching uh, that anywhere. Um, so yeah, that that's a big part of the problem. And and so uh, as a corollary to that, if you ask Ursinus again as a good you know representative Reformed theologian in the uh, 16th century, uh, w- what do you mean by the covenant of works? He would say, well, I mean the law, right? And so uh, it, relative to law and gospel, covenant of works is law, covenant of grace is gospel. And he says that explicitly. He has a large catechism, which you can read in the introduction to the Heidelberg Catechism. Wherever, where is that? <laughs> oh, here it is. But yeah, they're all. I've got a bunch of books that look the same. Uh, so there's an introduction to the Heidelberg Catechism, and then I will have in, in my commentary when, whenever that comes out. I'll have a, a section on this. But the, in the um, in the back of this volume is the first English edition of Ursinus's two catechisms. He did a smaller catechism and a larger catechism. And the, the larger he did first, the smaller he did second, and the, the smaller became the basic basis for the Heidelberg. But in his larger catechism, he's uh, very explicit that the covenant of works is, is law, covenant of grace is gospel. And so that was, again, that was just basic Reformed theology, and you find Reformed theologians saying that pretty much that way uh, thereafter. But as you uh, were suggesting, we lost track of that in the, uh, to some degree, in the 19th century. Although you could still find it in the 19th century, but in the 20th century, in the English-speaking world, we um, we lost it, and then we started to recover it towards the end of the 20th century. I think um, people are, you know, you say what you will about Meredith Klein; he helped us hang on to it. Um, he was one of the guys, he was a stickler for the covenant of, of uh, redemption and the covenant of works, as well as the, the unity of the covenant of grace. Sure. Well, you're working on the Heidelberg Catechism, so that has a law gospel distinction. That, would that, you recommend that as a good resource to get started on that distinction? A- absolutely. Um, it, it, you will never regret spending time the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, I, so I um, I learned the Catechism out of the old uh, RCUS German Reformed um, revision from 1978. So this is when I reach for the Catechism. This is what I reach for. But the uh, my my Federation of Churches uh, has published for four dollars a hard copy uh, mm-hmm. of uh, prayers and liturgical forms the ecumenical creeds and the Heidelberg catechism called forms and prayers. And you can get that from great commission publications. And they, so they've revised, uh, they have a revised uh, English translation of the Heidelberg and it's fine. I would have done things, a few things a little differently, but it's, it's fine. And, and then I have the catechism at, uh, uh, on the Heidelblog, uh, heidelblog.net slash, I don't know what it is. It might be Heidelberg hyphen catechism. If you look on the left side of the front page of the, of the Heidel blog, you'll see the Heidelberg Catechism there. So it, it uh, so I, I have my own translation, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it's absolutely clear. Where, from where do you know the greatness of your sin and misery? Out of the law of God, not out of the gospel, 
out of the law. That's the catechism. And, uh, and then it very clearly distinguishes the law between, between the law and the gospel. Uh, it's the gospel that, uh, whereby we are brought to new life and true faith by the work of the Holy Spirit, not the law. The law teaches us the greatness of our sin and misery, but it's through the gospel that we're granted new life and true faith. And then uh, it's because of the gospel and in light of the gospel that uh, God works obedience in us, and sanctification, and then flowing out of that obedience to the law of God. Not just some of it, we say, all of it. So there's really, yeah, if, you, if you just get to know the Heidelberg, the three parts of the catechism are guilt, grace, and gratitude, law, gospel, and sanctification. Uh, it's really not difficult. Those are the three parts of the Christian life. And uh, we just need to hang on to all three. And, uh, no reason to lose any one of those. Sure. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's really good and a, a lot to... A lot to think about um, any other any other resources that you would recommend for somebody that is just uh, just beginning to to kind of grasp some of these things with uh, law and gospel and sure. So the uh, place the one place to start is to go again. I'm sorry to keep, I keep uh, 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 pushing the, the Heidel blog, but that's why I do it. Um, so I keep um, the. Uh, on the Heidel blog, uh, go to heidelblog.net slash resources. And then you just scroll down there or search, and there's a resource page on law and gospel. So there's all kinds of resources there, uh, books, articles, quotations, um, chapters, so all, all kinds of things to, to look at. Uh, one book that is very, very good that lots of people have found helpful that I think is relatively easy to get is John Colquhoun. On law and gospel, C O L Q U H O U N, Colquhoun. He's a. I, I can't do it properly. I, um, I'd have to get a new um, pop filter for my mic if I did if I did it properly. Because it's uh, to do. It, I think to do it properly, it's like Dutch or Hebrew. There's lots of uh, in it. So, but uh, John Colquhoun, uh, law and uh, law and gospel. Is, uh, I, I don't remember the exact title, but that'll that'll get you close enough. That's a very uh, fine piece of work. Lots of people have been helped by uh, C. F. W. Walters' distinction, a volume on distinguishing law and gospel. I think there is a lot of good stuff in there. There probably are some things I would say differently than Walter, um, but I uh, know, and I and I have only read parts of it. Um, that's the interesting thing. You know, people say, "Oh, well, you're a Lutheran," and I say, "Well, I mean, in the sense, in the, in as much as." As uh, all Reformed people are indebted to Luther, and we are deeply indebted to Luther, sure. Uh, so what? Uh, Calvin uh, called Luther his father. Um, I just did an article in part to respond to the way people talk about Luther, you know, as if, you know, that's some sort of epithet. Um, so I've, um, I did it for the uh, for Southern Seminary, uh, their mm-hmm. journal on Calvin and Luther. Uh, so uh you know, uh, we've come to have this weird view of of Luther and Lutherans that Calvin did not have. Um, we we distinguish where he didn't, and we don't distinguish where he did. Um, most of the people who are attacking me as Lutheran worship like Lutherans. They use the same principle as Luther on worship, or the Lutherans on worship. That is, they do whatever's not forbidden, and um, and yeah, they think that they think of themselves as reformed. Um, uh, well, anyway, so. Um, uh, you know, the, you know, just reading good, old, I think, old-fashioned Reformed theology. Uh, Perkins is very good. Um, Beza, uh, Beza's little uh, uh, catechism, if you can get hold of that, uh, that it, the, the Christian faith he did is a little. It's actually a confession that he wrote for his dad. That's very edifying in this regard. Um, so other, uh, probably other resources as well. Um, but that 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 will get you started. <laughs> And, and so I was going to say, I, I learned uh, my distinction pr- from Reformed people. I didn't learn it from Luther. I came to, to Luther helped me understand it more deeply, but I, um, it wasn't Reform, it wasn't Lutheran writers, or Lutheran doctrines, or, uh, documents, or or even Luther himself who who uh, taught it to me. So for what that's worth, <laughs> uh, it's basic to Reformed theology. So you people who are saying that it's not Reformed, quit saying that. <laughs> Because I've documented extensively <laughs> that it's reformed. Uh, oh. 
Well, uh, <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Clark, just thank thank you so much for for joining us today, and uh, we've taken uh, quite enough of your of your time, and we really appreciate uh, you being on our on our podcast and on our show here, and uh, know that. Uh, Many people will will benefit from from it, as, like we have. So, it's given sure. me a lot to think about. So, thank you. Well, enjoy your freedoms there in South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, some of us envy you. Uh, it's a, it, uh, the Black Hills are one of my favorite places. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I was in Spearfish a couple of years ago, and uh, and I, I I spent a, a marvelous week at the OPC uh, camp summer camp in the Black Hills, you know, I don't know when it was, maybe 1990 or so. <laughs> and that was one of the best weeks of my life because I, they, the RCUS sent me out there to sort of scope out this camp and see if this was a, a thing we could, you know, cooperate with. We could go in with them. And I don't even know what they ever, I don't know what they did, whether they did or didn't. But they sent me out there to scope it out, and uh, there wasn't anything for me to do. The OPs didn't need to put me to work or anything. So I I just sat on the front porch of this cabin next to a trout stream. I had a stack of books, <laughs> sat in the in the sun and um in the it was just absolutely marvelous. And uh, reading, watching this poor guy try to catch trout for a week. <laughs> I think, I don't think he caught a thing. <laughs> I think those trout were really smart. Uh, I think I heard one of them laughing at him, but but it, I, I think he was enjoying himself. So it, it, what a beautiful place. Um, yeah. And the the good news is it's not Iowa. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, we enjoy, uh, we enjoy South Dakota and, uh, we've we've actually had some some people move here from from California. Uh, it, it is interesting how the the pandemic is uh, affecting <laughs> people's decisions and where they where they go and where they move. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, I I think ministerial education should be conducted in person. But uh, if the state of California reco- keeps us um, online, then um, I could do that anywhere. No, right. Well, well, you're welcome. You're welcome to, to come to South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask our governor. Uh, yeah, she's been a, she's yeah. been advertising pretty aggressively on the air, <laughs> on the airwaves in California. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. At a certain point, you may want to draw the line. But uh, I think yeah, for all the uh, refugee Californians, you, you, there needs to be a re-education camp. Where you just go for a couple of weeks, saying, "So, first of all, we want to talk to you about this little thing. It's called a constitution." So this this is a thing that Americans <laughs> hold dear. This is how we've agreed to live together, and um, and then you they need to be desensitized. Um, look, this is what freedom looks like. And, uh, <laughs> so, the, yes, yes, you can, you can do that. Like that's, what, that's what Californians do when they when they go east of California. They they say to everybody else in, in, in the rest of the states until you get to the. East Coast, I guess. Wait, you can do that? <laughs> Everybody else in between the East Coast and the West Coast says, yes, actually, in America, you can do that. <laughs> hey. Well, great. Thank, thanks again. For- <laughs> right. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, it's good yeah. to talk to you guys. God bless you. Hang yeah. on for a minute, Dr. Clark. <clears throat>